Okay, I'll continue a bit and then we're going to have a new micro. Um, so I first talk about challenges in bioimaging. Then I talk about assignment problems in bioimaging and then partitioning problems in bioimaging. These are two different ways for sometimes even solving the same thing. We look at, we look at cell tracking and you can either use partitioning or you can use um, assignment for, for the same task. Um, finally, I talk about um, a, a new line of research we've been doing, which you can also apply to bioimaging, but it's quite, of, quite interesting and, and very versatile, which is called computing diverse solutions in a graphical model. Okay, so here you've got um, various different problems. So this one is, for instance, um, the fly wing, and the goal here is to partition the fly wing into the different, into the different uh, cells here and to give have each cell having a different, different label. Each cell has got a different label. Um, then we also have the uh, segmentation or partitioning in 3D. Um, this particular problem is called connectomics. You've got EM data of the mouse brain and you're trying to find all of the neural connections in the brain. So these are all these neural connections here and this is a partitioning problem. And we're going to look, not for this particular one, but for 2D, how this is solved. It's a certain technique called multi-cut. Um, who in the audience know about multi-cut? Okay, one person. Good. So you're going to learn something about partitioning, which is, in, which is a, a small field, but it's actually getting state-of-the-art results for, for quite some problems on tracking as well. I think it's a very interesting set of techniques, which you may find useful for your own, for your own research. Um, then we're going to talk about semantic segmentation of C. elegans. So this is the worm here. The goal is to find uh, each, uh, each nuclei, so the core of the, of the cell, each nuclei, and you give it a name. So people have gone through, the, through a very painstaking process of labeling actually quite a lot of these worms and give every, every nuclei a label at a particular time point. And interestingly, this, this, for C. elegans, all of the nuclei always develop in the same way. This is called a lineage tree, and I will come back to lineage tree in a second. Um, so all of these cells, they divide always in the same unique way. So when you have a full, like a, like a worm, after, after um, a few days, it's always uh, the same number of cells. And also the precision is not varying too much. And that's what we're going to study a bit later. So the goal here is to say we have this input here, the data, you want to segment it and give it every, every um, uh, uh, new client, give it a name. Then we're going to have 3D data over time. So this is Drosophila and I'm not going to play the movie of a microscopic recording 3D data. So this is uh, top view and this is side view um, of, this, um, of, the, of the Drosophila embryo development. Okay, here you go. So, um, so it's pretty slow and then suddenly there, there are quite some rapid, rapid movements and then after a period of time you, you see the, the, the wrinkles of the, of, the, um, of, the, um, um, of the embryo coming up here. And so the goal here, what we have to do is to track each individual cell over time, which is in 3D, which is super difficult because they change, uh, change uh, size and, and shape, move around, and then suddenly there is um, quite rapid movement at the end of the, of the process again. So biologists, what they need is ideally all of the cells track correctly with accuracy ideally of 99% or even higher because then they can do certain studies with it. So what they do, for instance, to say they knock out a gene and then they study the whole lineage tree, how these, how these um, cells divide and, uh, and, uh, and develop. And then they say, for instance, okay, when you, um, when you have a certain gene knocked out, this affects a certain part of the, of the, of the organism, like in here or, or at this end. Okay, so here's another data of a fly wing, and you want to track all of these cells um, over time. So here's a movie of the, of the fly wing, and it's pretty tricky, right? There are a lot of, lot of fine details here, and this is developing. You see the, 
uh, the final uh, fly wing of these uh, stains here coming, coming out. Okay, right. So cell tracking, what we want is to have, for instance, for this small portion here, we want to have all of, this, of the tracks over time. And um, here I'm playing a movie now where you see the cells moving. And also when there are uh, um, dashed lines, then this cell is dividing. So this is now dividing, moving around, and dividing. And we want to have this um, over time as good assignment as possible. So that's called a lineage tree when you've got over time the whole division of, the, of, these, of, these, uh, of these cells. And people actually have been doing in the 1960s, have been doing for the C. elegans, have been going over eight years. Um, they have been studying a lot of instances of this worm over a lot of time steps and have, have manually annotated all of, the, all of the nuclei where they move and when they divide. So our goal is, what we have in Dresden is, is uh, to say for biologists, the goal is to have an interactive tool to go from eight years of work to probably one week of work with an interactive tool to labor for a lot of instances of this worm where they, where they go, where these cells go. Okay, so I have a, a demo here of an interactive tool or video of it. Um, this is for a simpler case of, the, of um, tracking these bacteria in here, which, which go up here and divide as well. They some then go up out in the end. So this is the movie. And well, what you want to have for one of these tubes here, we want to track all the cells and, yeah, and have, a, have an ideal automatic solution. But if it's not possible, we have an interactive tool. So here is this interactive tool developed, uh, which is already used by biologists. Um, so you can have, you go over time, you can say, um, you have one particular tube, you say how it's going over time. So these are three time instances, type minus one, T and T plus one. And you can scroll over time. And you see here, this cell, for instance, goes over here, um, or, or this cell goes here, um, or this cell sh exits. And this is actually incorrect because this cell should transition here and this actually should divide. So now what the user can do, can go in and label it and say, okay, that's incorrect. And then Tune automatically solves it with this new information and gets, um, gets a new assignment. Um, for instance, here the user can say, okay, there are five cells in here, so five. And then it's finding a new solution where this one is also marked and then completely changing the solution and updating it. So how do you do such an interactive tool? That's our goal. And um, so now come to assignment problems, which, which is one way of solving this. And then I come to partitioning problems, which is another way of solving it. So let's go back to this, um, to this E. coli, this is called mother machine. So we look at one particular tube, and um, we have this one particular tube over time, and we now want to track all of these cells. It's actually uh, work by Florian Juk and me, and also Fred Humphrey, he did a lot of work in that, in that space from, from Heidelberg. So the first thing we want to do is finding hypothesis set um, of possible segmentations of these, uh, of these cells here. And we say, okay, there could be like this, one, two, uh, three, four, five, six possible segmentation. There could also be, as I apologize, a bit hard, hardly visible, there could also be two here, or there could be, a, a, this could also be one uh, potential segmentation, okay? Now we take that over time for each of these, um, at each time point, we have hypothesis segmentations. Um, then we do that for four times, time points, and they're different uh, possible segmentations for, for the column at that time point. Now what we're doing is we um, introduce possible assignments, and later on I will explain that these assignments will be binary variables. But so we say, okay, this, this cell here could go here, this could go here, this could either go here or here. Then we also have exit assignments, so this can go up here. We also have division assignments. So this can, can, for instance, divide, this cell could divide into two cells here, and this cell could also divide into these ten, two cells. So we have a lot of them at each time point, for each two time points, and we have then we do that over all possible time points. Then what we're going to do is we put, put, put probabilities for all of these assignments. And then the goal of this minimization is to find the optimal configuration 
which then resolves and say, okay, this is the optimal assignment. Okay, so this was an overview of the method. Let's go into details. So how do we formalize this? And I'm now formalizing this as an integer linear program, and then we're going to solve it with Gurobi. And the next assignment problem we're going to do, Gurobi is no longer the, the best method because it doesn't scale well enough. But here Gurobi works, and the integer linear program looks as follows. We introduce V for all of these, for every hypothesis uh, uh, segmentation, we have got a variable VI. Okay, so in this case we have got, uh, we only model this part, let's say. We've got one V, V1, we've got these two variables, V2, V3, and these two, V4, V5, for all of these hypotheses. Now we do um, an inequality constraint of the following form that we say each path from the root to the leaf must have maximum of one of these Vs switched on. So there are, there are three paths. There's one path here, one path going here, and one path going here. So these are the three paths. It's a bit hard to see. Um, so these are the three paths. And on each path, you have only one variable being switched on. What this makes sure is that we, we will select um, um, hypotheses which are not overlapping in terms of space. For instance, if this one here, if V3 on this path is switched on, then this can't be switched on because it would be overlapping, right? It would, we would switch this one and this one on, then they overlap in terms of space. But when if this one on, we could still have on this path, this one switched on, right? So this one um, is possible. If you switch this one on, it's not possible because it's also on this path. So this constraint, this inequality constraint, makes sure that we only have um, a cell hypothesis selected which are not spatially overlapping. Okay, next one are assignment variables. We have assignment variables going from hypothesis segmentation to the next time step. And there are different uh, assignments. There could be an exit assignment, there could be a mapping assignment that this cell goes here, or division assignment. I go to individual costs in a second. But then we have also constraints which make sure that it's again sensible, uh, that we don't make mistakes. Um, so the first one is that every cell can only be explained by one action. So all the actions going into one particular cell, there must be, um, all these ones must be uh, uh, smaller equal one, the assignment. That means only one can be active or none. And this is for the other way, for all of the outgoing actions. And this one here is another assignment to make sure that the number of, that an ingoing action is equal to outgoing action. So if we have, um, this one, this cell assigned to an incoming action, it also needs an outgoing action. Okay, and then we write this as a linear program. There are certain uh, weights here, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, we need one extra constraint, which is similar to this marginalization constraint we had before, which makes sure that um, we have, um, that if this cell is explained, then it must be explained by one of these two actions. Okay, so, um, so this one, if this one is one, then also one of these two must be on. If this is zero, then none of these has to, uh, should be on. Okay, this is an equality constraint. Equality constraint, inequality constraint. Okay, so these costs are the following. For a, for a vertex, we say, how confident are we? Is it, does this shape here look like this here? So we, we've learned, for instance, random forest, or could be also neural network to predict this confidence. And then for, for mapping or for uh, splits, we look at the size and position. So position shouldn't move so much, and the size, it shouldn't, um, it, um, if it's, for instance, divides, then this size should be similar to these two sizes. Again, these, these variables could also be learned, for instance, with, with neural networks jointly with solving this problem. That's actually one of the research where one can do. Okay, and then you solve this with Gorobi, and for this particular problem, even bigger instances, Gorobi is still possible to give you the global optimum of this whole problem. And this then actually leads to currently state of the art on, on these particular problems for cell tracking. Um, the main use for biologists is really this we call leverage editing. So you've got here, you say, you, this is a mistake here, this should be a cell here, which should be an assignment. Then you go in here, you mark it, as I showed before, and then you get actually not only this fixed, but also other parts fixed, and you say, okay, this was a wrong assignment, it should rather be a split. 
right? And this is a very helpful tool for biologists in a very quick way to go through, edit it, um, and then being corrected. It's also Gorobi solver is faster when you have it called a warm start. So you have a certain solution when you do such an edit, it, it goes much faster than, the, than finding the first solution. Typically, you can also enforce that when the, when the user goes from left to right through, that you don't make any changes in the past, that you only do forward changes. OK, so let's talk about another assignment problem where we needed a more uh, complicated solver. So this is the semantic segmentation problem, where we have the C elegance, and we want to find, uh, for each nuclei, we want to find the name of the nuclei. What we do is we formulate it as an assignment problem between an atlas, where we know the labeling, and an instance, where we don't know the labeling. So when you've got a unique one-to-one -one mapping, you can then transfer the name. Because you have the name of the atlas, you have that, you transfer, if it's a unique uh, corresponding uh, nuclei, you know that this, this nuclei here has got this particular name. So how can we do this? Um, so the first thing we do is actually we have a lot of um, atlas images of, in this case, 30 C. elegans with the corresponding name. This is the brain region here, where, where, where we don't have any names attached because it's too densely uh, 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 populated with, uh, with uh, nuclei, which is hard to say exactly what, what is. OK, so the first thing we do is actually we do a mean atlas of mean shape and mean position. And um, so, th yeah, so this one is the mean, mean position and mean shape. And now we want to find the mapping of this mean atlas to the, to the target. Again, it's very similar to the previous problem, but now we come to a, to a, to a slightly different formulation which makes the optimization harder. So first thing we do is we find, in, we find possible hypothesis segmentations. Uh, we do a, use a generalized Huff transform to find a lot of um, hypothesis segmentations. Um, and then we say, okay, there are a lot of hypotheses. Now we have to find the assignment of, of a nuclei here to any of these hypotheses. We formulate in the following way. We have here the mean shape and location. We also, this is visualizing the local, the variance of the position. Um, so some of these nuclei have, they don't very much in position. Some others vary a lot in position. So these nuclei in the middle here, they can be here or here in these over the different atlas images. OK, so now we again use it. We have an assignment problem. So we say we have a lot of links between the atlas and the um, target. And a link can be either 0 or 1. OK, now um, what we have are, for instance, constraints of the form that, as we had before, this is this uniqueness constraint. So we want that each of these possible connections, only one can be active. As we had before with these actions on a certain cell, only one can be active. So we have, for instance, here on these links here, we say the sum of all these ones here, um, of these actions here, or assignments, must be a smaller equal one. Only one can be active. The same or the other way around, for, from this to this mapping. OK, now we formulate this assignment problem. Um, and we have here unary terms on the assignment based on position, shape, and confidence. As we had before, it shouldn't move too much, and the shapes should be similar of, of the nuclei and of this here, of the target. But in this case, we have something additional, which is called an, which is a pairwise field on the assignments. What we do is the following. We make an neighborhood system, like, a, like, a, like two or three, um, like each cell is connected or nucleus connected with the three neighbors, and in both, in, actually in the atlas only. Let's make a neighborhood system here. Then what we do is we look at if two ones are connected with, with, um, with, with a neighborhood system, we look at the vector of how it, of, of what, is it, what is the distance and what is the angle of the relative position of these two nuclei, let's say these two. If now, if these two assignments are active in the, in the target, we also look at, if these two are active, so these two are active here, we look at how, what is the difference between vectors here? Is it similar length and is it similar orientation? Okay, so what this models here is a local deformation field. We have, um, 
So this one here should be, it can globally can move around quite a lot, but locally the movement of two nuclei, if they are assigned, assigned here, there should be similar movements in, in the target and in the, in, the, in the atlas. So it's a local, local deformation model. So now due to these pairwise terms, we need a more advanced uh, optimization. And um, I'll, I'll piece over such as Gorobi don't, don't work. They're simply too slow. So now I promised from the last presentation there's one extra technique which I haven't mentioned, which I'm now going to mention. It's called dual decomposition. It's a very generic technique. It's very useful. Um, so the idea is the following. We have a hard to optimize problem and we split it into two easier to optimize problems and can be multiple. I just make the example here with two. So two easier to optimize problems. Um, so possible to optimize at least approximately. And now the idea is very simple. We want to minimize this energy. We can write it in this form here. So E is E1 plus E2 plus and minus the same term. So this is just one number. Theta is the same size as X. So all number of variables. It's called a dual, dual variable here, a dual vector. And we add it and subtract it. Now the idea is to follow. This is greater equal than solving it individually. It's quite intuitive. When you, when you think about it, if x1 is equal to x2, then you haven't changed it. You still find the same x. But if you give the freedom of being different x1 and x2, then they can find a better x, which has got lower energy. Okay? So it's quite obvious when you, when you, when you divide these into two minimizations, it's, um, it's a lower bound, essentially. And now what we can say, well, we define this as a lower bound on theta where theta is this, is this, uh, is this uh, dual variable. And now the idea is we want to maximize this lower bound with respect to theta. We want to find the optimal theta. And so if you maximize this bound, we, we hopefully find um, a theta which is even equal to the energy. And then in this case, we actually know that x1, x1, x2 are the same. And then it's a global optimal. Also, L theta is actually a concave function where the global optimum can be found exactly. OK, so that's our goal. We want to maximize the theta, the lower bound, um, which is this problem here. The optimization is an iterative optimization. We give a certain theta. We pass that theta to the subproblem, subproblem 1, subproblem 2. We solve them independently, the subproblems. And then we feed them back. And now we update the theta by adding with a certain lambda here the so-called subgradient um, on this on this problem. It's 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 because it's non-differentiable. You call it a subgradient, and this is exactly this 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 vector here is the subgradient which moves which makes a step towards the maximum uh, bound here. And with certain setting of these lamb of these lambdas, you can actually make sure that you reach a global optimum. OK, so here's actually an illustration of the optimization. Typically, it goes like this. The lower bound goes up. It can wiggle around, can go up and down. But, but in the limit, you know it's going to be the maximum bound. And the energy, as the energy, we, for instance, have to take one of these solution, solutions. We get two. We, let's say we only ch look at x1, or we take the minimum of x1, x2. And so the energy of that solution goes down, can jump around as well. And if they meet, then you get the global optimum guaranteed but it's not guaranteed. OK, so what do we do this with the C elegance in particular? We have different subproblems. We have one problem is called linear subproblem, which ignore the pairwise term. So we ignore, we say, OK, let's do, let's do this here, but without this here, just this one here. And you can act either solve it with, with an ILP solver, um, or we act, there's a method called Hungarian matching, which solves it globally optimal in a fast way. Another problem is the Max Frosa problem. Now we ignore this uniqueness constraint, but have the pairwise terms in, and, um, and then solve it. And that's also Max Flow problem. We can now use GraphCut or Max Flow to solve it globally optimal. Another one which also useful are local subproblems. We only look at the certain neighborhood here of our problem, only a certain neighborhood, and we now solve that for all possible assignments globally optimal. And these are a lot of local subproblems we can add. 
Okay, so this is what we do. We have not only two, we have three, and there are actually many more. And uh, we solve them, and we can still use this, this technique of solving the subproblems, feeding back, getting a better theater, and then going forth and back. Okay, and this is how we nailed the, um, the uh, C elegance matching. Here you see some results. This is when you have manual segmentation of the nuclei. You have them done beforehand. There's one method which, have, which has been uh, published at that time, getting 86%. This is without the local deformation model, you get 77%, which is lower. But with the de local deformation model, we get 93%. Also, when we can run our full method of automatically finding the right segmentation, and then we get close to that previous number with manual segmentation, we get 83%. Actually, in that paper, we did also global deformation model, which I skipped here for um, um, time reasons. OK, so this was assignment problems. And now comes um, a family of problems called partitioning problems. So this is very useful for um, a, a lot of tasks. One is, for instance, when we partition the fly wing into each of these cells. For connectomics, is currently the leading method um, on the table for uh, connectomics. It's Fred Humbrecht is leading the competition, and he based, is based on multicut. And also, actually, state of the art at the moment for this cell tracking, it's I think slightly better than this tracking by assignment, is using a lot of super pixels, and then you cluster them, you partition them over over time. You say, what is the right um, uh, partitioning, and each partitioning you find is then a track in here. Okay, I explained the basics of what the technique is doing, and then actually I, sh I give a detail of one CBPR paper we had this year on using this. Um, so you have here um, an image, and what you want is in an unsupervised way partitioning it into the different into the different clusters. So what we want is, this is zoom in, we want each pixel to be assigned a cluster. Um, you've got three different clusters. And a cluster is defined by being four connected. Okay? Now, how we phrase it again is as a binary labeling problem, where we say, where we label edges, and if an edge straddles two uh, segmentations, we make it one, and if it's in the same segmentation, we say it's zero. Okay? So, um, so this one now, from if you have if you have this labeling of what's straddling the segmentation, then you can read out the partitioning. Okay, so there's a one-to-one -one mapping between partitioning, valid partitioning, and a valid segmentation here, or a valid uh, binary labeling of these edges, and the following constraint has to hold. And this is called the multicard constraint. Also gives then rise to the to the multicard polytope. Um, that's the following. The constraint is in this form here, and what it says is the following: that for every cycle in the graph, there must not be one edge only on. So let's look here. If you find this cycle here, there are two edges on. If you have this cycle here, there's no edge on. If you have, for instance, this cycle here, there are two edges on. So for all possible cycles in the graph, there must not be a cycle which is only one edge on. So not valid partitioning would be if you have this edge being switched on, because then you find this cycle here, which has one edge on. That's not valid. So you can prove that if you have this constraint satisfied, that this is just written in a formal way. If you have satisfied for all cycles, then you have a valid partitioning, and then you can go from this to this here. Okay. So they're also then, the only costs we have are uh, costs on the XE, if it's on or off. And <coughs> what we do here is we have a negative cost when there's high contrast. This is a zoom in of this koala here, somewhere here. So if it's high contrast, we have, we have a negative value. And if it's uh, low contrast, we have a positive value. And this makes sure because it's negative that at least something is cut. Otherwise, there would be the optimal solution is that nothing is cut. Okay. Now the optimization works as follow, and it's, it's uh, relatively fast. It's, it's an, a constraint generation technique. So let's solve the problem without any of these constraints here. Let's just solve this one here and look at the labeling. And then, and then we try to find a cycle 
here which is violated. So if the reference is this edge being on, we try to find the cycle, and this finding cycle can actually be done with dynamic programming efficiently. We find the cycle, which is violated, and then we add this cycle to this set here. And then we go solve the ILP again, the integer linear program here, and we go back. We look for violated cycles and so on. And in practice, you only need a few rounds of optimization until you have fixed the problem. So I don't know, probably in practice, like 50, 50 constraints are needed for this, for this koala here to be correctly partitioned. Um, there are some presentations I probably add a bit later as well, where you can then see over time how this resolves. So if there are certain cycles which are fixed, then this going to be this area is going to be completely changed. So with each cycle, there can be quite dramatic changes here. Okay, so this is here one example of uh, where you have st stone wall, you get such a labeling, or you have cells, you get such a labeling. So this looks okay. Mm -hmm. But, but you see that there are a lot of small segments between the cells. So we had uh, this year's CVPR paper where we actually extend on this result, where the two things are missing. So what we want is also a labeling of foreground and background. You say, okay, the cells here um, should be foreground label, and between the cells, it should be background label. And additionally, what we want is each individual cell, which is foreground label, foreconnected, should be convex. OK, that's another explicit prior knowledge. And then this is the result we get. So this is here with, this is here with the foreground background labeling. So we, we, we go from here to here. We explicitly say what's foreground, what's background. And then we have the convexity constraint. We say, OK, this here, um, every cell in here has to be convex in a discrete sense. I'm not going through detail here, but we have to define a discrete, on a discrete grid, the notion of convexity. This is the RLP, not going through any details, but so you see this is possible to be solved with currently standard RLP solvers and warm start. So we have the objective here as the multi-cut objective. This is some weights for, for the um, unary labels for the, for the foreground background. And then these are constraints. This is kind of the summing constraint we had in the uh, previous RLP to say it has to be one. This is the convexity constraint and so on. OK, the solver is, is, an, is a two-loop solver where we have con uh, constraint that it has to be a correct multicut, and then we have another loop looking at convexity constraints. And if, for instance, we first solve this one here, and then we look for convexity constraints, we add them, solve the ILP again, and so on, until there are no problems with multicut or with convexity. OK. Um, then you get, for instance, here, nice segmentations of these cells, so they are convex, and uh, you've got foreground background. You can also have relative positions. Um, so here are three labels, and you get this one here being convex. These two don't have to be convex. And you can also say that, for instance, partial labeling. You say this object has to be convex. Um, so if you, yeah, so this object has to be convex, but not with respect to the white, but only with respect to the black. So you can have an ordering of convexity as well. OK, so that's the uh, finishing that part. And the last part is on, um, is on diversity. And uh, probably do try to do it in 15 or 20 minutes. Um, so this is joint work with a series of people here from my lab and also from uh, Moscow State University or Moscow Skoltech and from Graz University. And um, it's actually a, a short version of some of the um, um, interesting uh, parts of, um, um, of a recent tutorial we had at CVPR on D um, diversity meets deep networks, inference, ensemble learning, and application. Um, it has been jointly done with Truth Batra. OK. So quite often, uh, when you solve graphical models, um, the, the one of the first things you ask for is, what is the optimal solution? So here we have a graphical model with unary and pairwise terms and only two labels. I mainly deal with two labels. And, and OK, so we find the optimal solution. So these are all possible solutions, and this is the energy. OK, so this is, for instance, for semantic segmentation. Uh, this is the image, and this is the um, optimal map solution, maximum a posteriori solution, um, and that's the solution here. 
Um, this is the ground truth. Now, what you could ask is, give me another solution. I want to see how my, how my solution space looks like around the, around the minimal. And this is the second best solution. And it's only, you got, don't see any difference. It's only different by one pixel. Because all these solutions here, they, look, they, they are all in here. The, the, the also other good ones, they are also only, they're only different by one pixel. So now what we say, well, we want to explore a bit the model a bit more. And so we ask, give me a solution which is um, different to this solution and also low energy. And so probably you want to find this one here, which is different in some sense, and I come to that, and also of low energy. And this one is a diverse second best, and it's actually much better closer to ground truth than, than this solution. So there are various application scenarios for this. For instance, for understanding your model. And when I talk to biologists, they very much like this, uh, this particular view and, and, and this tool. So what it's doing here is you've got many, you have different cells. And the question is, is that, are these two cells? Is it one big cell potentially even? Or and is this a cell at all? And so what it could ask is, give me the five best diverse solutions. And, it could, and, and, the, and the method then says, OK, either it's one cell, or it's red, it's two cells, and this is not a cell. All these are three cells, and then these would be the three cells. And then the user could go in and select and say, no, these are actually two different cells. And then it's only limiting the search, uh, the space of possible solutions. And there are many other application scenarios of these um, diverse solutions or multiple solutions uh, for training model parameters, empirical risk minimization, or ranking of inference results. OK. So I'm not, there's various related work, but I'm mainly focusing on this work here, on a recent work we've been doing to improve on this. OK. So let's go through a very simple approach of how to solve it, and then try to improve on it. So the simple approach is doing the following. It's computing for every, so this is the first solution. Also, the upper letter here says the first solution for three different pixels, one, two, and three, and four. So now we say, give me a second solution which is different. For every pixel, you, every pixel, um, so it's a pixel-wise uh, pixel distance measure, and it's a hemming distance. You say, well, if this one, in the, in the binary case, if this one is on, then this one should be more likely off. So you pay a negative, you, you encourage if they're different. If they're the same, you, you, um, you pay zero. You pay zero, but if they're different, you get a reward minus delta. OK, and you do that for every pixel. Now, um, so this is how you formulate it. And you can solve it for y2 for the second problem. Um, and this one is simply unary term. If this one is known, then this one is simply unary term. OK, and here visualization, you say, give me something which is away. Um, you may get this as solution. OK, now you do a third one. And you can do it in the same way. The third one should be different to the second one and to the first one. So you formulate it in this way. Um, should be different to the um, third one, should be different to the first. And the second, again, is a unary term for solving for um, uh, y3. And here in the visualization, you want to be different to the first and to the second. And you may end up with this solution. So what we aim for is actually we say, well, let's connect also this here and have all of them jointly derived. We want to have three solutions which are all different, but all low energy. Okay? So here, these three circles basically keep their distance, but they move to a value which is better, which is better minimal. And that's our goal for the next uh, 10 minutes, how to solve this joint problem in a good way. So we can formulate it by having um, all the possible solutions, 1 to m. This is the en sum energy of all of them. And this is the uh, distance measure between all of them. So this is all of the pairs between pairs of solution, between all possible pairs. And this is sum of a pixel to say that there should be, you encourage differences. And here's minus is taken out here. OK. So now I'm, I'm, I show solutions for the following. We first want to solve this and get better solutions than what when, if you solve it sequentially. Then I'm going to present a method which actually solves this globally optimal. And then at the very end, I show that it's even possible to solve it faster than the sequential method, which is 
kind of interesting. Okay, so how do we solve it? First of all, it's, it's hard. If you run, for instance, TRWS, you get a very bad solution. And the reason is, you now we go back to the first talk, we see this submodularator condition is not satisfied, so it's non-submodular. We see it in the following way, when you look at this term here, um, it's, if they're same label, it's zero, and if they're different labels, it's minus one. So this condition is, is, is non-submodular, because this one here is uh, minus one plus minus one is not greater or equal zero, zero, okay? Right. So now one idea we did was an ICCV paper uh, last year was to say that we encode it differently. We, s we give all of these, these terms here, we put into one variable which has multiple labels. We say, okay, if this binary and we have three possible uh, configurations, we say all the possible two in the power of three possible configurations um, are the, um, are a certain, are, uh, uh, give you one configuration here. So we have uh, two in the power of three uh, possible uh, configurations. And we get a new energy on Z, which uh, we could, can actually then solve. And there's a certain theorem. I'm not going through all of the details. We're running a bit late. Um, so there's a certain theorem that if this one here is, um, if the original energy is matrix, then this is also matrix and you can run alpha expansion. OK. So now what's quite nice, we can now uh, solve this. Not globally optimal, but we can solve it. And we get com considerably better solution than the sequential method. So this one is here an example for segmentation. This one is ground truth. And our second solution is this one here. And none of these solutions have got as good quality. Um, the problem is speed at the moment. So this one here has got uh, 2.4 milliseconds, the sequential method. And this has 47. Uh, 47.6 milliseconds, so it's much slower. There's a trick which I'm, which I'm uh, uh, skipping over now, how to deal more efficiently with large number of labels um, and large number of solutions, but I'm skipping this here. So we can also apply to multi-label, and again, we get much better solution than the sequential method. Um, this is sequential method, and this is what we get, and here's a solution which is much closer to ground truth. Okay, again, also for the multi-label case, um, it's much slower, like five seconds versus 0 0.03 seconds. Okay, but at least we get better solution. Now let's solve it globally optimal. There is a very interesting insight. When you take these solutions, you can sort them in one way and they're nested. That means that when you go for a particular pixel from, the, from one labeling up to the other labelings, it transitions one once from zero to one, but never back. So you see that like, like this particular pixel in the interior, it's always one, or this pixel go from zero to one. Okay, so it transitions once. And so now, let's skip this theorem here, but what you can do now, it's quite interesting, you say, well, okay, I basically assume, I know that there's some, some ordering, and I just force this ordering by putting an infinite term in here for not never transition from one to zero. You never transition from one to zero, but infinitely. And some days this gets from non submodular to submodular because this infinite is always greater than, than zero, zero, than uh, one, one. Okay, so now we can actually apply graph cut and we get a, a global optimal amount and rain is also even a bit faster here uh, than previously but it's still not as good as the function method. But we keep the same solutions. And we can also use multi-label and we get already a bit faster in terms of time, um, but we're, not, we're, not, we're still slightly slow with the function method. Okay. So the last one I just want to show is that we can even be faster than the function method um, by doing a certain, by, by doing a, the following trick. And it's interesting when you look at these solutions here, um, then you can, and you look at another method called parametric flow from the of 2007. Um, this parametric flow is going to be the following. You, you solve the energy, and you just add a certain, uh, certain weight alpha to every unit, and you just push forward. 
you get a single of those solutions, and when you apply this method and you compare it to what you get out here, it's surprising that there are certain uh, alphas for which you exactly get the desired solutions. And even more, we came up with a theory, uh, it's actually a one-page long proof, but there's a theory which says you can pre-compute these alphas. So you can pre-compute the alphas from the diversity measure. And this is quite interesting now, uh, what we can do is we can even run it down the parallel. We take the energy, we, we compute new energies where we simply get give you a certain alpha. And we find, we solve this, uh, we have a new energy and we solve it with a unit term. And we get out all of these solutions using graphite. And these are the, the global optimal solutions. Okay, now actually we have a method which is very fast and even um, and, and better in terms of uh, quality than the original method. Okay, so the main point I'm showing these these things here that actually this problem on computing multiple diverse solutions, the multiple solutions of your of your net problem for certain classes of problems, especially these pixelized angle distance, um, a lot of progress has been made and there are pretty fast solvers for it. And you can now analyze your problem not only in terms of getting one solution out, but, but multiple diverse solutions. Okay, and that concludes the uh, uh, second part. I uh, talked about challenges by 